This is an exciting time for the church. This early on, let's say the 50s, and the church is just exploding, and there's no holding the gospel back. It is just running to all the four corners of the known world, and it is running rapidly. It's a very exciting time, but at the same time, there are challenges with uncontrolled growth. Yeah? Uh, I deal in business and operations and executive this and that throughout my life. And when you have this explosive growth, which is driven by the Holy Spirit, there's no holding it back. There's also little pieces that need to be addressed. So one of the, the, or two of the big issues when you have such massive growth is quality and message uh, seem to taper off if you don't have the right training or leaders in place as things go. This is just a, a human sort of item we have to deal with. Now, certainly the Holy Spirit's going to hold the greatest weight, and it's going to move where the Holy Spirit is going to move, but we're going to have questions that come up. And in this time period, what often would happen is, is you would have a, a pair that would go in, preach the Word of God, churches would form, and then they would leave. So if you had questions, who are you going to ask? They didn't have the internet. They didn't have anything really formalized written down yet. At this point in time, the gospels were still being penned. Everything was getting perfected. And so this letter that would go off to the Galatians, and there it's sort of in that greenish part in the middle, up uh, uh, rolling up there near Asia, this whole province of Galatia, probably in the south, is starting to have questions and starting to live out their faith in the way that isn't consistent with what Paul had in mind. And so there's trouble. And as he writes this letter to Galatians, it's interesting. Uh, Paul was very well schooled and written, and all of his letters came out with the usual greeting. Hello, this is Paul. I am just thankful to God for you and for everything you're doing. And then he would get on to the letter. Galatians is not that kind of letter. Galatians, he just hits them hard. He has nothing good to say. He just immediately cuts in and goes, what are you thinking? What are you saying? What are you doing? And he starts off with the most important of all, the gospel, uh, this, this magical word, the gospel. Now, there are many challenges that Paul was trying to deal with. So when you expand like this, you have people that have never known faith at all, unchurched, we would call them, that are just received the love of Jesus Christ. Now they're trying to meet and follow, like, what do we do now? Exactly how do we live this out? And so they would bring in some of their old practices, you know? How does the Easter Bunny and Santa Claus fit into all this? Or on the other side, if you were raised in the Jewish faith, you're like, well, what traditions do we keep or not keep? You know, what follows through? What did Jesus want us to keep or not keep? So every church would be this bundle of differentness. And Paul was one of those tasks with trying, especially in the Gentile diaspora, sort of the edges of trying to formalize and make sure people understood what the true gospel was and make sure they lived their life around the gospel message. And so all these different practices were rolling in, and he was trying to deal with this with a very limited staff. On top of that, like I said, the Gospels were just being written, and so they were finishing up, and of course, that's a very expensive endeavor, especially in their time. We're talking tens of thousands of dollars to, to, to produce these by hand, make copies again where they need to go. So you would have had all of this going on that Paul didn't, wouldn't have the benefit of. He certainly spent time with Luke and others, and he knew the gospel message, but there wasn't something he could particularly leave at each church as they continued to learn and to grow. And so the organization of the church was just starting to figure itself out. How do we get pastors in place? How do we um, bring in individuals that are able to say, yes, this is what's going on. This is what's happening. Uh, this is how we collect for the poor. This is, you know, just to create to just the everyday life that uh, churches need to be. And this would go on in Acts 15. If you want to see some of the glimpses of this happening, it's kind of interesting if you want to go and take a look there. And then on the, the, the last piece Paul is trying to do with is authority. Who has the authority to say this or that about the Christian faith? As they're just emerging, if you're not an apostle, do you have anything that you get to say about the Christian faith? And so he's bundling all these together. Now, this all hits home to us today, I think in a huge way, talking about authority, the one true word, 
the one true God, the way to live. All of this is really hitting home today, right? Because we're connected with all of this information and all the many lords of this world want to have something to say. So what is it about our faith? What is Paul trying to get to? How does that work for us today? Because we can truly see how Jesus richly and daily provides for our living through a few of the pieces that Paul is dealing with. It starts here with his word. Do not take this for granted. Do not take the Word of God for granted. This is something that was meticulously put together, informed, verified to make sure everything in here came from either the source or from the source. So this is incredible for us to have, and it's been that way for thousands of years from the Old Testament to the New. You have the Word of God. You have the interaction between man and God right here. This is super important. And many of you know how to read, which is even more of a gift of our modern times. And so you have access to the Word of God. This is how He first provides for us. Now, within this, it describes the gospel message. And we see Paul moving on here. He's been prowling about the gospel. Kip kind of talked about this as he came out swinging. But I want you to know in verse 11, says Paul, brothers, that the gospel I preached is not something that man made up. So you got to wonder what the Galatians were saying as, if he's answering this, right? Like, what, what would you think as a human being that Paul would have to address this? You know, who are you, Paul, to say anything, right? Uh, who says you have the, the word, or, or what is that about in your life? And so he keeps bringing up the gospel. Do you know what the gospel means? How, how would you define gospel? The good news, okay, yes, that's one of the pieces that it's used to describe it. Good telling, and then later on, the old Anglo-Saxons, the good story, it's the narrative. It's everything involved around Jesus and His story, everything. So it's this entire package of Christ about the kingdom of God, about salvation, about the way of living, the source of ultimate truth. So if you could bundle one sticky piece of candy, like if he crammed all the thoughts into one big ball of candy, and it was sticky, and it was all stuck together, that's the gospel. That's everything about Christ that informs us about who he is, what he's asking of us, what he thinks of us, what he has planned. It's this whole message of God. Now, for the apostles and others, they would have been around Jesus, they would have seen this, and so they have a very particular message given them by God that they're spreading throughout the world. Now, as it's spreading so quickly, this kind of breaks up a little, and so the learners and teachers have to come in and go, uh, 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 no, Jesus did not have a psychic called Tonto. Get it out of there. Uh, all of these little pieces are coming up, and so they're having to deal with this. The Holy Spirit is driving it, of course, and gives everyone authority. But Paul is saying, what are you doing? That is not the gospel I gave to you. That is not the gospel that was preached to you. What are you doing out of these other pieces? Get it off of there. He's scraping it off, scraping all the stuff that doesn't matter off in this letter, saying the gospel matters. And it is something I made up. It's not something you get to make up. It is something given to us by Jesus Christ, Okay. I have a hard time telling the difference between a new thing and schizophrenia, you know? And so when we have the Word of God, we have what he said. Paul, as many of the others, which I am tasked with today, is to make sure stuff doesn't get stuck to it that isn't true, right? That isn't about Jesus and his message. Paul says this, I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by the revelation from Jesus Christ. This is from God. We didn't build this up. We didn't invent this. We don't have the capacity to do this. God gave it to us so we would know. And so you ask, how is Paul in a world that is very far apart from one another and doesn't exactly have a, you know, the, the tweet or an X or whatever we want to call those different things or a Snapchat or anything where they can see exactly what they're saying constantly, right? How does he know about this? Well, this is the trick of a teacher. I say trick. I've lived with teachers my whole life. I have a teacher who is my wife. My grandmother was a teacher too. And they're really tricky. Yeah, they are. They know the difference between what you write and what you don't write, okay? 
it's kind of interesting because if you write in a very simple way and you have your certain way of speaking and the words you use, and then all of a sudden the next day you're saying, therefore, colon, semicolon, uh, finally, first, like they immediately, what does the teacher know immediately, right? You didn't write this, Johnny. There's no way. Um, because each one of you has a voice. Each one of you has a voice. That's a package of your knowledge and your vocabulary and who you are, and teachers get to know you. And so they immediately know when something is off. Now, there is a Christian voice called the gospel, and it's put together by Jesus Christ and the work of the Spirit. And those who know it best can hear the voice, right? And go, that's not, get Tonto out of that. You know, no, get, get this out of here. This is not part of the gospel, right? This is the essence. And when Paul hears these messages coming in going, what are they doing? <laughs> what are they doing? This is not of God. This is them putting this stuff. We need to get this cleaned up. And so Paul is telling him, hey, this is not the gospel I gave to you. Stick to the gospel. But why is that so darn important? Why is it important to stick to what Jesus said? Because it's defendable. Let me say that again. Everyone pay attention. It's defendable. When it's the truth and you live and you speak in it, sometimes it can be very hard to say it in certain situations, and you know you're going to get punished or it's not going to go well for a day or a week. But when you speak the truth, others can rally around you and defend you because it is the truth. Okay? That's very important in our life to know what you believe, to speak what you believe, right? Know the truth, live it, and speak it. So if I said to a group of people who would be very mad at me, because most of the world does not believe this, that salvation comes from faith alone, how many of you would defend me in this room? I do want to see hands this time. How many of you would defend me if I said salvation comes from faith alone? I would have hundreds of people that would defend me. And though it might be uncomfortable in that room at the moment, or people might attack me online and otherwise, all of a sudden you see people coming in defending because they know that to be true as well. You have a pack, folks. You have somewhere to belong. You have the Spirit. You have God. And, and it will be better in the end to speak the truth. But if I said, yes, salvation by faith and by giving at least 50% of all of your assets over a lifetime pre-tax and performing something great that would be defined as a miracle and having eight kids, if you do that, then you get to go to heaven. How many of you would defend me then? I don't see any hands. That's not the truth, is it? Nor would you stand up and stand beside me Refer to that, right? That's where, that's where Paul is hearing all these other things being attached. He's like, what are you doing? Not only is that not the truth, it's indefendable. It's not real. You need to scrape that stuff off. So he's saying stick to God's word. And that's what I brought to you, right? That's what I brought to you. All right, so not only does he give us his word, but what do you do with it when you got it? Ugh. Do I have the power then to say the things in here, to teach what's in here, to do what's in here? Because there's stuff in here that's hard. Am I really going to say that? Am I really going to call people on that? You know, who, who am I to do these things? And, and Paul is being checked on this. Paul's authority is being checked. And when I talk to the kids, when I talk to others, this is a huge part of our life today. You've got the word, but what do I do with it? What do I do with it now? So Paul goes on. For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many Jews of my own age and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when God, who sent me apart, set me apart from birth and called me by His grace was pleased to reveal a son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not consult any man. There was no human that gave me authority to do this. There's no other person that can say this or that to you. Even in our own belief, the Lutherans, Luther himself said that most of this priestly stuff is just hooey, it's just mist and wind. The Holy Spirit, the work of Jesus Christ in your life, gives you the authority, right? This is where that source of power comes from. 
not some other people, not because they say so or not. I did not consult any man, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was, but I went immediately into Arabia and returned to Damascus. And after three years of Jesus working me with the spirits and me learning and growing, and I went up to Jerusalem, and he spent time with Peter. I saw none of the other apostles, only James. You're like, why is he doing this? Why is he bringing all this stuff up? Well, there's a very practical reason. He ain't an apostle, is he? So if you're, who, the, who are you? This is a lesson learned, kids. No man can tell another man what to do. No human can tell another human what to do. Who are you that I have to listen to you? We all fall short to the glory of God. We are all in the same condition. Why do I have to listen to you? Kids say that all the time. Why do I have to listen to you? They're right in asking. Because I'm your dad. Because I say so. Or th th that's, those are poor answers, aren't they? That, that's, a, that's a desperation answer. Because I said so. Why? And they're right. We need something other above us. We need something greater. Oh, Peter here, right? <laughs> Oh, Peter had the best training. He logged the most hours of Jesus. He had the most power and enthusiasm, and, and he, had the, he was there at the, uh, uh, the, the, the wonderful Pentecost and all this stuff going on, and yet Peter, when all he had to do is say he knew Jesus, what did he do? He denied him three times. So even the best of us is the worst of us. So I'm not listening to any other human. Something above us needs to come in. So it begs the question then, who are we to say or do anything about God? It is because Jesus himself gives you this word, works in your life, and in multiple places in the Scriptures, just like I said here, this is coming from Jesus Christ to you. Speak it. Live it out. It's important. You will have people to defend you. It is the truth. It'll take time, no lie, but we go and live this stuff out. There's something that happens when we don't. When God gives us something that we need to say or do and we don't do it, there's something that happens. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the story of Jonah. Jonah is one that was given a word. He was given a message from God, and he chose not to speak it. He chose not to do it. He chose not to speak it. What happened to Jonah, you great biblical scholars? What happened? He spiraled to the very pits of despair. His life just continued to tumble and get crushed until he was in the belly of the darkness. His life went to ruin because he had the Word of God. He knew what he needed to say. He knew what he needed, and he didn't. And it just crushed him, crushed his life. And so for us, we are to speak it, even in our own diminished capacity, because the authority to you say the words, to live out, is from God, not from me, from your mom or dad. It's from God. Paul is reminding them of this. Hey, this is coming straight from there. But I say that, then people get worried. What if I say the wrong thing? What if I do the wrong thing? Oh, Paul knew this all too well. So even Paul knew his, where his limits were, right? Paul knew where his limits were. Even though he's kind of getting a little braggadocious, right? Hey, Jesus did this, and Jesus did that. Jesus did this for me. He ends with this. Jesus richly and daily provides us by His grace. Hey, that's what makes Christianity the most authentically human faith in the world. It's based on your failure and God's work, okay? All the other religions are based upon you getting it right 51% of the time. Christianity is based on you not getting it right very often, okay? And Paul ends this way. You know, I assume... I assure you before God that I am not writing you, that what I'm writing is not a lie. Later I went on to these different regions, Syria and blah, 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 blah. I was personally unknown to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. When I entered into these areas, it wasn't because I had this great power or anything going on. I walked in there with the authority of Jesus. And this is the beauty of it. Paul used this as his ultimate defense on whether he had authority or not. Watch for the fruits of the Spirit. If the fruits are there, right, then it is of God. If the fruits are not there, then it is not of God. 
And so in the end, Paul always said, what are the results of the ministry? Do you see the fruits of the Spirit or don't you? And I think that's a very good argument, <laughs> right? Look for the fruits of the Spirit, if they're present or not. And he says, hey, they didn't know who I was, and yet they only heard about my reputation. What reputation did they have for Paul? You know, this man <laughs> tried to destroy us. So he's kind of a little celebrity on his own, isn't he? Even in that day, his reputation kind of followed him. Dude, there's that guy who tried to kill us. Now he's talking about Jesus. That's all they knew about him. And, and, and in the same way, Paul is humbling himself here, going, I'm the worst of you. And that Jesus decided to work with me. Right? You're going to make mistakes, terrible ones. Paul was a walking story all on his own. But then he said at the end, but they praise God because of me, because of the fruits of the Spirit, right? They saw what came of it. Not the fancy words or the suits or the hair or the buildings or any of the stuff. The fruits of the Spirit were there at the end. That's how they praise God. They saw Him at work and what was going on. So, we have the Word I'm telling you right now, he's giving you his authority to speak it, to live it out. And don't worry, you're going to make a ton of mistakes along the way. That's what grace is. Grace is unmerited favor from God who brings you mercy and forgiveness hmm? for knowing him and working with him. That's where your identity is. That's where your belonging is. And that's where you can live that incredible adventure that God has planned for you but you live it out of this relationship with God, staying connected to the power source, then I got to tell you, you're going to have one darn of a ride to your life. If I could go back to little Johnny and say, don't worry, you're going to make it, but you're going to have an H of a ride <laughs> getting there, right? It's going to be quite a ride to get here. Just, you'll get there. Just enjoy the ride. It's amazing what God does for us. And Paul is communicating that to that original church. So, what we know and what I proclaim, what we proclaim, all comes from Christ Jesus, period. From generation to generation. Yes, we've put it in a codex, we've moved it on, we've trained different people, we have pastors, we, we do that, but it comes from Jesus alone. It comes from this work of the Spirit. What, as Paul says, what has been given me, now I pass on to you, Okay? That's that gospel, that bundle, that narrative of Jesus that we cling to, that we hold to. It's only through the work of the Spirit in Jesus that we have the ability to do or say anything that brings life, right? That leads to life, those fruits that Paul was talking about, that, that eternal, that ultimate good that, that comes from all of this. And what's amazing as he ends this little segment, it's all out of grace. It's all this he does for us only out of fatherly divine goodness, right? Because he loves us and wants to work with us. That's to our benefit and his folly, for sure. But he loves us without any merit or worthiness in us. And I guess for all this, it is our duty to thank and praise, and serve and obey him. We're just getting started in Galatians, folks. <laughs> um, and Paul ain't playing right? And we thank Him for it. Amen. So, exciting stuff. Uh, we'll continue that process. Right outside, there's a, there's a uh, I guess, a foldy out there uh, with a further study into Galatians. So, if you would like to go further into these passages, grab it on the way out. It was right next to the bulletins. It's kind of, it was well done and put together by a lot of good people. And uh, so, grab that on your way out.